Welcome to the latest edition of the Reimagine Mobility podcast series. I'm here with my good friend Pete Savagin. Pete, thanks for joining me today out of California. Maybe a little early for you today, but thanks for joining me. Pete, you've worked in so many different places from traditional OEMs to startups, aerospace, all sorts of different areas. I would say probably fair to say mainly in the electrification space, at least as of as of late. Um, give me a little bit of a history of, of where you've worked a very high level, and then let's jump into air mobility. That's really what I'm interested in to talking to you today about, uh, because of your background, uh, and, and because of your experience there as well. Well, Ed, Ed, thanks to Stefan so much. I got really, uh, you know, flattered, happy, and, and proud to be able to be on your podcast to, to talk today. Uh, yeah, I've got a long background at, in, in electric vehicles. Uh, I started with uh, uh, the General Motors uh, project back, the EV1, the original modern EV is what uh, you know many people call it, uh, and developed at GM uh, a capability there in propulsion systems and specifically electric drives, a little bit of battery electronics along the way, and uh, and systems engineering kind of organically grew that capability for. You know, R and D, supply chain development, academic connections into design, synthesis, analysis, validation, production, uh, to take some technologies that kind of existed in other industries, but put them together, make them automotive in terms of reliability and cost, and and develop that and and grow grow a, a process and a capability of the company, which was awesome. But it's a big company, and. Uh, you know, did really uh, interesting, very proud of a lot of the work there. Interesting hybrids over the years, including uh, uh, the first plug-in hybrid, the Volt, a couple of generations of those, and at my time ending there with the Bolt EVs. Uh, I left there and worked at a couple of different startups, like you said, uh, a couple in the automotive space in charge of engineering. And another one, uh, very interesting, that kind of leads us into today's conversation, which is... Uh, a company that worked on electrified aircraft, a startup company uh, that could see the proposition there. And it's uh, uh, did great work there, did some um, uh, experimental certification of large hybrid electric aircraft, at least the largest at its time, which you know isn't really that large, but uh, you know, like 40 foot wingspan, 4,000 pound aircraft, hundreds of miles of range. So I know a little bit about that space and I find it uh, really interesting. Uh, today, uh, I do some consulting and advising, and one of the companies I advise is uh, uh, H3X, which is a uh, uh, electrified aircraft um, uh, propulsion system company, so it's super high-density electric motor uh, applied to the variety of electrified aircraft. So, Pete, I remember specifically the day you told me you're working at a again a startup for electrified airplanes right and you were super excited like you always are with your technology that's what makes it always fun talking to you because you're you're so passionate uh, besides your tremendous technical know-how uh, but, but let me get right away to the point why now why electric airplane now i mean you know, two or three years ago, I said, yeah, why not? And then suddenly, you know, the it looked like solid-state batteries, which we talk a lot of higher energy density, safe for lighter, all the good stuff that you've probably been looking for for 20-plus years, right, working in with batteries, is at some point going to come. But clearly, they, they, the space is not waiting. We've worked on a program with Eviation, right, an electric airplane startup as well. You working on it, so give me your perspective. Why now? What what makes sense? What are the challenges, et cetera? Yeah, uh, I, uh, you know, it's it's timely. And yeah, why now? I think there's a couple of forces at play um, that, that that where things can meet in the middle. One is um, CO two and regulations um, uh, surrounding that, uh, the CO2 footprint of all the air travel today, if you do the math and some people do that kind of thing, is somewhere between maybe 2%, 4.5% of global warming effects. Uh, so that comes from CO2. But, you know, 
Aircraft are different. Their emissions are much higher in the altitude and they have a more profound effect up there. So uh, CO2, uh, NOx, oxides of nitrogen, which are largely eliminated in automotive use because of catalytic converters, um, now they're untreated up there. There's a lot of NOx that comes out. That's smog for me, but it's also a, a greenhouse gas. And then in addition, there's contrails, which uh, is a more complex atmospheric effect, but apparently leads to global warming. So there's, there's a little bit of a range up to like four and a half percent. But with the mitigation of CO2 in every other industry, you know, possible and, and underway, uh, projections are by maybe if, if untreated, if there is no real corrective action and air travel continues to grow, uh, by uh, 2050, estimates are this would be about a quarter of the greenhouse gases. And so this is a tough one to mitigate. Uh, it's, uh, you know, kind of famously in the consciousness of the, the maybe the more sensitive uh, Europeans who think about CO2 more often, it seems. Uh, there's even a word uh, in a couple of the languages, uh, flixcam or flight shame, uh, that kind of came to the fore maybe three or four years ago where people were looking for other ways to travel that word. So CO2 intense, an aircraft, you know, kind of intense. So it's it's a very visible kind of uh, growing luxury, and it's technically really difficult. That's a one factor is this CO2 or global warming, climate change mitigation. Uh, but the other factor is opportunity. Uh, there's this thought that, hey, you know, air travel is super convenient, for long trips, but shorter trips have become less convenient. The economics of short hop travel, the the five hour uh, to go, something you can almost drive five hours. For instance, if I want to visit um, my daughter in Flagstaff, Arizona, you know maybe that's a seven hour drive. But by the time you chain it up, you know you can't fly there direct out of L.A. And then you got the queuing time, you got the Uber, you got the the layover. And uh, some of those uh, and, and connections are just as well as getting in a car and driving. So it, wouldn't it be great if I could just fly there direct? Well, you can't because it's not so economic to make that flight. So could electrified flight lower the costs? Could lower energy costs? Electricity generally cheaper than aviation, diesel, uh, fuel, or kerosene effectively. Um or the maintenance expenses. You know, there's advantages. Uh, the, the maintenance expense, a big part of air travel. And would it make economical a lot of the regional short hop flights? And it kind of pencils out. Uh, in addition, other use cases altogether, the EV toll, or so people, you know, promote the flying air taxi. There's a few different kinds and use cases for them. That'd be a whole nother kind of podcast. But there are some new use cases that economically look attractive if you could get an aircraft to electrified costs. Cost of fuel, cost of maintenance, you might cut the cost in half the total operating cost of a, a manned flight, you know, one a piloted flight. So nothing extraordinary other than a very high energy density battery at a very high power density electric propulsion system or electric motor and and put together in an efficient aircraft and whether that's a VTOL or whether that's a more conventional fixed wing aircraft seems to unlock that and so there are several startups and there are several you know big companies uh Airbus kind of famously in the space uh, uh there are several several companies that have you know large initiatives uh, billions of dollars to develop new aircraft and the enabling technologies for them. And it's maybe leading edge technology if you compare it to automotive, but uh, progress made nonetheless. Do you feel that the technologies we're pushing today towards in, in the automotive space, right? And you mentioned it, higher power density, uh, safe for lighter, all the good stuff that we also need for aerospace. Is aerospace helping ultimately or in the next couple of years with their push into this electrified 
flying, again, as we are reimagining motion or mobility there, will it help the automotive or will actually automotive and the push we're doing for, you know, again, a range anxiety, right? So you can visit your daughter in Flagstaff in, in, in one charge instead of two or three. Who's pushing who? Or are we really moving in parallel and kind of every once in a while back borrow from, from one another? Who's leading or are we really on the same trail? It's a it's a good kind of conversation. Uh, it, you know, generally the the you know an aircraft of any type is uh, extra sensitive to mass. Obviously, the effective range. If you think of range anxiety of the aircraft, you know, number one, that's that's real anxiety. You know, it's not just being stopped on the side of the road. Uh, so <laughs> there's more to it. It's a more serious undertaking. Um, but uh, an aircraft, you know, unlike an automobile, has a major component of its range is limited by mass. And a car, you know, mass plays a factor in rolling resistance for sure. And then when there are grades involved, it's there. But generally, you know, in a car, you know, mass is, is a smaller portion. In an aircraft, uh, the range is entirely proportional to mass. And so you get a couple of factors in an efficient aircraft as a high battery mass fraction. So the percentage of the mass of the aircraft that can be dedicated to the battery and uh, a high energy density, you know, for every kilogram of battery, you, you want more watt hours in there, more joules of energy. And then, of course, you, your drag's a bigger factor because aircraft travel faster, so the aerodynamic factors are, are greater. And so it brings us to this kind of leading edge proposition for the core technologies of the batteries and the motors, but the the fundamentals are similar. You know, the chemistries are similar, but in the air application, for instance, the battery. A lot of people say, "Oh, you need to get to somewhere around 400 watt hours per kilogram to really unlock the space." Where you know, battery cell that that's at a pack level, and a really good battery pack for a car today might be around 200 or in the high hundreds. Uh, my Tesla Y, I think, is probably about 170 watt hours per kilogram of battery pack in it. Um, and, and, and people have done better. But in that neighborhood, so somehow doubling. And, you know, part of that through chemistry, part of it through efficient packaging uh, gets that done. But an aircraft in the business case can probably afford a more leading edge type of battery. So you mentioned earlier, Stefan, solid state. And there are several uh, working on that. Um, there's some chemistries that maybe don't work so well for uh, automobiles, but might make sense in an aircraft like uh, lithium sulfur uh, for some aircraft. Um, and... Uh, and so you get this related battery, related chemistry, but on the leading edge. And maybe maybe just made, if you add up the volume opportunity, it's just much less than the, you know, hundreds of gigawatt hours per year that one needs to electrify the road vehicles. Uh, aircraft is never going to be that size. So it's really more of a prototype or pilot scale production. But it's complementary. And it's along the way um, that I think road vehicles ultimately will still want to use higher energy density batteries, no question about it. But an aircraft needs to reach higher and pay more. And it's it's not unlike buying an engine, a combustion engine for an aircraft, uh, cost a lot more, made in lower volumes, has some specialized features. Uh, same kind of thing in... in uh, in the electric motors can be considered that company I mentioned, H3X, super high uh, power density. So continuous over 10 kilowatts per kilogram, which just, again, is like double or more uh, the best you would see in uh, applications uh, for road vehicles. It's still a motor, you'd still recognize it as such, but you know, different kinds of materials, different kinds of cooling schemes applied. Everything kind of turned up to 11, but made stable enough and testable enough to be put in an aircraft certified to be safe, safe to carry, you know, people. 
So this is the emerging business that uh, kind of hinges on those things. And it seems to be happening. And that's really the second factor is that technically this appears possible. And in fact, the demonstrations, you every month or so, you see another demo of uh, kind of an impressive piece of electrified air mobility. You just brought me to a to a question. I know in the automotive space, when we're talking to the voltage levels of the, or the high voltage batteries, right? 400 volt is sort of the standard now. People pushing the 800 volts and already seen in the heavy duty truck space, but also in the passenger vehicle, where we're talking about getting maybe to 1,000 or 1,200 volt, right? What is it? What is it in in the aerospace? I I, I never asked that question, so yeah, I don't know. Good if you question. Have... And, and it's certainly a higher voltage you know, earns a couple of merits in terms of mass reduction and mass is more precious in aircraft. So voltage is one of the things uh, to push for. In the, the hybrid electric aircraft that, that I, you know, worked on um, at, at the company I worked at, Amp Air, I should say, um, a great, great startup company here in the LA area, uh, used a 700 volt bus. So it was kind of high, relatively speaking, but nothing extraordinary. And, um, and that affords, uh, you know, lighter weight bus bars and wiring and so on, uh, has some secondary benefits in the design and execution of a, a high energy density motor. Um, and in addition, if there's a charge rate challenge and Many of the use cases for especially EV tolls have a very quick round turnaround. So uh, charge rates, you know, maybe C4, you know, levels of four, you know, which is like a 15 minute full charge. So a really quick turnaround uh, for a kind of an air taxi use case. If, if that's going to happen, um, higher voltage will help with the charging of the ground operations to turn that around. Um, as well. So uh, there's a temptation to turn the voltage up high, but it needs to be, there's some caution there as well. Obviously the, the normal uh, creepage and clearance constraints apply and you know, the higher the voltage, the, the, the more carefully considered and designed the insulation system needs to be. But aircraft has a second, you know, a, acute uh, environment to consider depending on the aircraft. But if we're talking about a Passenger aircraft, you know, let's say a 20 passenger aircraft that's going to go into pressurized territory. So somewhere over 15,000 feet, maybe we need to pressurize the cabin. We get to high altitude where flight is more efficient. I suspect a trip to Flagstaff would, would take us up that high, maybe higher. And at that, uh, at that altitude, we have to worry about uh, corona inception. And so we're much more sensitive to voltage. And so we have to temper our, our appetite. Well, I've seen work done at uh, kind of academic work done out to about 2,000 volts. It seems that aircraft are settling in more around, you know, 1,000, maybe 1,200 as an upper ceiling that it, you know, maybe has the right balance. But, uh, you know, time will tell. I think if large aircraft, you know, narrow body, a couple hundred people, uh, become electrified in a decade or two, um, then the, the temptation on that size of propulsion system might be to go to that next level of voltage and the accompanying uh, insulation systems. But voltage is a good question. Now, I know in the automotive space up until at least whatever, a, a few years ago, I don't know exactly, the, the, the question was not necessarily we want to go to 800 volts. The question was more will the complete ecosystem, right, with, with components for inverter, silicon carbide, helium now, and, and other, can, can that side keep up with the push to go to 800, or do we need to stay at 400 because the available components to make it work haven't quite caught up yet? I assume we see a similar things with, with airplanes then when they want to go to 1,000 or, or somewhere around there. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, the... the... The customization of parts uh, is is always possible, and will always be the case when the when the business is really there. Uh, 
business is, you know, developing right now. And I can say, at least from experience, it's much more comforting, for instance, looking for a connector or a, a contactor, uh, a bus bar insulation system, where the manufacturer says, hey, it's, this is rated for uh, 1,000 volt use or 1,200 volt use, or, and, and, and you know it with some certainty that there's no additional you know, subcomponent development necessary. We don't need customized contactors just for this proposition. So um, you kind of have to go to the back of the catalog or the, <laughs> there, there are catalogs always, but it, it's typically the, the upper end premium product that anticipated maybe uh, over the road trucks or something uh, that, are, that are rated at the appropriate current and especially the voltage, uh, but they're already developed. But eventually, as I said, if we get to bigger aircraft, then uh, then that ecosystem, as you say, beyond just the few custom parts we normally think about, but all the all the glue of the of the DC bus and the charging side of the business and the accessory power devices, the air conditioning devices, all of that needs to be, you know, made probably you know custom and developed for. Um, that expanded ecosystem. All right. All right, maybe to, to wrap it up, Pete, you kind of explained at the beginning, you started with the EV1 at GM, and now you're working on electrified airplanes. So uh, a span of tremendous experience, expertise, and, 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 and bits and pieces of brand new technologies that you help bring into not reimagining mobility, but making new mobility possible. So if you look back in your 30 plus years of what you've done in the electrified space, let's stay with electrified, what are you looking today forward over the next five years? What excites you the most to see coming next when we're talking about electrified, either, either motor technology, inverter technology, battery technology, or just complete systems, or maybe even new areas of, of electrification, right, that may come. What, what, what do you look forward to with, again, your tremendous background what, what do you see? What's next? Right. So anything is accelerated over the years. But what are you looking for? Yeah, I'd say my my background and and accomplishments are are a reflection of the quality of the people I had a chance to work with. So I you know I, I won't take too much credit for that. Uh, and I learned a lot along the way. Um, right now I, I see I, I would just stay in. Um, th th I mean, there's so much going on, uh, and I I have to think though. Uh, it, it it the the spread of mobility electrified mobility you know we talked about aircraft for several minutes but really let's think about the more cost sensitive uh everyday type travel and we'll, we'll leave air behind for for a moment what i'm looking forward to is this uh a uh, ubiquity of electric travel every time you know in southern california i see people driving those one wheel scooter skateboard looking things and and you know i watch and they're actually being used i mean they're recreational mostly but i see people actually you know with a backpack and headphones on and they're going to go do work somewhere on that they have to that is their mobility yeah it's not for me but but it's for someone uh but if we look more worldwide it's really a cost situation uh uh, that little scooter costs like two thousand bucks, which is not, not a great value to the interesting device. But scooters are used to move a whole lot of people around the world. Uh, in, in India and in Vietnam, especially in China, for sure. And uh, those are being electrified, you know, and there are millions of them made each year. And the cost pressure on that is super high, and that's turning over fast. That in all kinds of uh, really pragmatic uh, cost reductions can come from that industry and make its way into automobiles. And by the way, the cost reductions take us out of uh, the scarce materials. There's a lot of kind of fear factor around, oh, you know, nickel and cobalt and rare earths. Uh, uh, well, you know, you can make perfectly great electric vehicles without any of that stuff. And many people do in cost-sensitive applications and are getting more and more out of ferrite magnets and 
uh, you know, iron-based batteries, iron manganese, you know, things that are much more plentiful and easier to extract and more economic. So I'm looking forward to, Stefano, the next five years, seeing those technologies, a little kind around the earth, still electrifying uh, new modes of transportation and taking the cost base down for, you know, everyday type transportation in cars and trucks and in scooters. Cool. Very good. And I got one more question. So sorry, you got to put you on the spot. I have one <laughs> more question that just popped in my head. And I just want a yes or a no answer, okay? And um, I hope you could do it, Pete. Switchable batteries. We see it BYD, or I mean, sorry, NEO's doing it in China. BYD may be doing it, but I know NEO for sure is doing it. There are some voices, and I know we have some startups in, in uh, I think, the L.A. and certainly Silicon Valley area as well as are close to you that are, have been working on swappable battery-type systems. With all your history, let's stay at least with, not with air spa airplanes, but let's stay on the ground, so heavy-duty trucks and, and passenger vehicles. Swappable batteries, viable or not viable for the U.S.? Yes or no? No. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Pete, and thanks for joining us on the latest edition of the Reimagine Mobility Podcast. Thanks for listening to Reimagine Mobility Podcast. If you liked this episode, please subscribe and tell a friend.